Good morning, SRECon. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Today, what we're going to talk about is the end game of SRE. And so one of the things that I've thought a lot about over the last few years, you know, here at SRECon, in my work at Equinix and other places, is when we get past the kind of initial phase of building our platforms, we built the best Kubernetes clusters in the world. We built CI CD pipelines that you know, make our code flow into production with feature flags. We have all these wealth of tools that make reliability so much easier than it used to be. But there's still incidents. We still struggle with reliability. Sometimes we have these amazing tools available to us. And sometimes these incidents really trace their roots back into the socio-technical layer of our organization. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And to talk about it, um, we're going to enter a JRPG world where the first thing you do when you come into a new town in a, new, in a game is you got to go around and talk to people. And it's the same thing for incidents. So um, my friend here, let's see if my controller is being funny. Oh, it's not going to work. Um, pause all, John. Um, you know, uh, it's game over, man. Like, he, he couldn't make it. Um, you know, but so he's going to sell us. Like, you know, these folks have the best SREs and infrastructure money can buy, and they still have incidents. So we're going to go at the request of my friend uh, who, who couldn't make it, uh, can't go do this retro with us, and we're going to go help these, these teams do a retrospective on an incident that they had. So to meet the teams, to kind of give you an idea who we're all going to talk to, is, um, you know, they're all a little different. And so we have the leadership team. We call them the brass. They work in a place that's fancy called Mahogany Row. Um, they act like they're the adults in the room. And they sometimes are. But the, the thing to remember about your leadership team is they're just people as well, right? Make the same kind of mistakes, have emotions, have lives, and things that happen. The SREs are called Team Marathon. We'll talk a little bit about them. They're, I'm helping them with the retro. They built that amazing platform. And again, everybody's saying we have incidents. There's a team called Team Inferno. They usually deliver, but what they deliver doesn't really work right. It's not really what the customers want. So we're going to look into what's going on there. Team Disco is kind of at the center of this incident. They try really hard. And they, they work so hard, and they're, just, they're really putting in their hearts, but they're not getting anywhere. And so it's not technical issues that they're running into, so we're going to try to figure out what it is that's keeping them from making progress. A tip I have for every engineer who's growing their career, SREs, you know, software engineers, um, staff engineers, is you know, go talk to your salespeople. Because your sales folks, they know what customers are saying when they look at your product. And they go, well, that's not really what I need, or you know, it's not reliable, or it sucks. Um, and your salespeople will know all this stuff. They know things that we don't know as engineers. So they have a different view. And so Glenn here is telling us that Team Inferno talks a big game. They make a lot of bluster and noise. Um, but their reputation sucks. Customers don't really have anywhere else to go, so they're kind of stuck with this product. And uh, as a result, the company has a bad reputation. Again, the disco geeks always deliver, but they're never on time, and sometimes their releases are rough. Um, but they're always busy. They're busy, 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 busy. You know, and always, you know, the SRE team's always the best team in the company, right? So, you know, like, they, they pretty much rock. But the sales guys can't tell because they see these reliability issues, so they think we're a bunch of jokers when they see that. Um, we meet the, the local DBA. His name is Courage. Um, he's got a very calm demeanor, and he's you know, a, actually just a big cuddle bear. Um, and you know, in this incident, he f had to log into the database as admin and make changes to the schema live. And uh, has anybody done that before in a live production database? It's terrifying, isn't it? Um, and I'm usually like wired for a while ever afterwards, so we came up, Courage and I came up with this term, cognitive zoomies. Right, where you just can't really get out of that headspace. And Courage is, a, is you know, a, a, an excitable engineer, so like after this, with this energy, just talking about it, you know, it's a full moon, the sky is clear, I love coding, we're writing thrust tonight, boys. Woo! 
So now we're going to meet Team Disco. So these folks are kind of at the center of things. So we're going to get the initial part of the story. And then we run right into the manager of the team. His name is Manager Greg. And, you know, his people work so hard, you know, and he's really dedicated to his team. So I think, you know, these conversations are longer, but we only have about 45 minutes together. So, um, you know, he's really hoping this retro will help. So let's talk to his people. We meet Polly Maff. So she's kind of one of these people that is all over the place. You know, takes care of all the stuff between the cracks. You know, the, the, the log disk that's filling up. Or, you know, she notices a cron job that fails every once in a while and just takes care of it. But as probably a lot of you folks have experienced, when you do this kind of work that's in the liminal spaces, it's really hard to get it recognized by the business. So, so this is something that, that's interesting to me. I'm not sure if it's related to the incident, but we'll find out as we, we go along. And, you know, as usual with these folks, there's kind of a bunch of us who are very similar and are into this kind of work. Um, Isabella is the engineer who pushed the button to deploy the code. So what, kind of what happened, what she's telling us is, and I forgot to tell you this part. So, um, you know, they, they deployed just a regular deploy, but while working on the, the code for this, this feature, she noticed that some database tables were inconsistently named and thought, well, I'm just going to fix this up as I go. I'll write a migration, and I'll ship it out with my deploy. And she pushed the button, and the deploy system has always been reliable, right? Like, it works at 100% for the last six months, never had a failure. So when she pushed the button and the deploy and the migration failed, she just saw that it was failed and was so busy, she went back to work on other stuff. So like, she's kind of terrified here. And so one of the things we get to do as SREs, as people who look at incidents, is, is spend some time with that person to help, help them manage that emotion, right? Let them know that they're safe and, and provide a safe space for them. And then we get that full story from them. Our senior engineer on the team tells the oldest story in software engineering, which is that the software engineers are always bitching that the product team has not given me complete enough stories. The, the spec isn't complete. I didn't get enough details. And so this comes up almost every time I talk to a software engineering team trying to help them figure out what's going on. And so he's just kind of telling us this normal thing. But it, the thing is, is that this is a point where we encourage engineers to get deeper with their, their product managers and maybe get them closer to the customer. But there might be something else going on here. And that sometimes you run into product people or different parts of the organization where they're protective of their role. They, they're like, this is mine. These are my customers. I'm not going to let you talk to them. And that's an org smell, right? Like it's something that we can fix. We can start to address and talk to people about how important it is that our engineers, that us, and, and everybody who works on our products has an opportunity to talk to and meet and empathize with customers. And we meet Devo Pistorius, who takes care of the, these build pipelines we heard good things about. So, you know, people, it's so solid, people ask her to work on other things. But what most of us who've run these systems know is that it takes a lot of work to keep them healthy, right? Like, just because it has 99.9% .9 availability or 100% availability, like it's such a thing, um, it, it takes a person kind of keeping, taking care of that system and keeping it healthy over time. So we've learned a little bit about, about these folks. We're gonna, again, we'll get into the story as we go. And that's kind of how these stories come together sometimes. You get little fragments, and it doesn't really come together until the end. So I mentioned that I think that this team is churning. And I've seen this in many roles I've been in, many teams I've talked to, where some, and I've actually seen this case for real ones, where an engineering manager told me that they were being pushed to increase the number of points that they put on every sprint. And there is nothing that's gonna piss me off faster because velocity points are for the software team. They're not for anybody outside that team to be juicing performance or trying to push more work onto that team. So what's happening here is we have people trying to boost performance, trying to squeeze more blood out of this team by making them put more points on, but they can't actually focus on their goals. They're just churning across tickets, right? They're, just, they're not making progress, and they feel like crap every week because they never finish their sprint, and it's kind of an unvirtuous cycle that tears the team down. 
and destroys velocity. Now we're going to talk a little about some normal things that happen in leadership teams. It happens in any team. It's a human thing, but when it's pretty common, especially out in enterprise land sometimes and kind of older companies for there to be a hierarchical management system, right? Like people follow orders. Uh, it's very authoritarian. And so sometimes communications end up flowing up and down through the leadership tree. And it's very slow and it's frustrating. But the other thing that happens is if, say, so Pandora took and showed dark mode to a prospect. Prospect said, I love it. I love dark mode. If you implement that and put it in the product, I'll buy it. And this can be toxic, especially to a young company, right? Because what happens is, is the folks in charge smell money in the water, and they got to have it. Got to have it. It's my, I, gotta, it's gotta, I need this prospect for me, I mean, for my company. Um, and so um, I, I can't even read this. Um, I wrote it, but I can't read it. Um, but what's happened is he's taken dark mode now, and it's transformed into theming the whole site. Should be easy, right? Just, just a mere matter of a little bit of CSS. CSS is so easy to get, to get right. And so he asked his VP, VP pod, to do it. And now we've gone from a theming to color schemes. And of course, this guy went and did the thing. The worst thing we can do to a team is he went to Team Disco and told him to drop everything and work on this new feature. So you think we've made that team any healthier? They're in bad shape, right? And we've just destroyed any velocity they had going to go and build some feature that a customer might not even buy. And rightly, they complained, but you know, people have different motivations. You know, leaders sometimes get focused on that next role and increase. It's not always what's going on. Maybe they have things going on in their lives, but they make bad decisions every once in a while. And so we got a reason why psychological safety is so important is so that people have the opportunity to go like, no, 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 we can't do that. We need to work, finish the stuff we're working on. Then we can go work on that. So maybe next sprint. And to finish off this game of telephone, right? Um, they, they, uh, so if I like went over here to the corner and told a piece of information to this person over here and had you pass it around all the way through the room, we got all the way over here back in the corner. I think if I said like the color orange, if we got back here, we'd get like, I don't know, like tomatoes. Because it's just, that's what happens when we pass information through multiple humans. It just, we have information loss. So there's probably, in, a factor in this incident is that just people weren't or communicating very well, and they had priorities that were other than what was good for the team, and so it's just perfectly natural things happening. So I think now we've talked to the leadership team, and now we'll go meet Team Inferno. And I'm just going to tell you, this color scheme, you know, the way these guys are looking, this team's a mess. And right away we meet the boss, right? The boss is, um, you know, thinks this quiet quitting thing is BS, um, you know, because when he was a lad, he worked 60, 80 hours a week in COBOL, hustled like crazy, and he turned out fine. But you know, the thing is, I've, anybody else notice that when people say, well, I happened to meet and I turned out fine, it's always, always some kind of repression going on there. And then another thing, I've, I've actually seen this in the real world too, is you know, this guy being the boss and kind of authoritarian, when the, the security team came to him saying, you got exploits to work on, you have problems in your code, he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to threaten my people with termination. Then they will pay attention to security and problem solved. So I, I'm guessing that's contributing to the low quality of code these guys are shipping. I think most of us have run into this guy before. He worked 100 hours last week. He gets free food. Um, unfortunately, there aren't showers, so his complexion is kind of fading a little bit. Um, we're getting a little bit of a miasma off him. And he's kind of a jerk, a brilliant jerk, right? Um, you know, he told those nerds that he was reading their tables. So we just learned part of the incident, right? There's, there was an outside team accessing database tables directly instead of going through probably an existing API. So we'll probably see that this surprised people, fundamental surprise.
And we meet Leah Deb. She has a secret. Shh. So this is a secret for all of us to keep for Leah. She's interviewing. Because this team is toxic. And so, you know, it's easy to, to look around at teams around us, or maybe the ones we work with, and we see some of these toxic conditions, and it's not really our problem. But what happens, this has a corrosive effect, not just on that team, but the teams around them. They make bad decisions. They go and read database tables directly. They're, when their service suffers, other services around them suffer. And this person, following around this 10x engineer, um, is frustrated because she's cleaning up his messes, and he's being a jerk and won't let her implement tracing, which would make it so much easier to clean up after him. So every incident is like hunting for a needle in an infant haystack. And you know, so now she's in this state of mind. You know, she's kind of checked out. So she's kind of, you know, like when I quit, they're going to be so screwed. I mean, right off the bat, and it's like unpaid internships like, are, are just nonsense anyway. It just creates a place for privileged people to have internships where people who aren't privileged can't have them. Um, so there's a problem right out of the gate, but a thing also I've seen in the real world is the boss brought in a new developer metrics tool. There will probably be some here at this conference, some of you might work at these companies. They're not all bad, but sometimes they get, do get used in ways, naively often, that are really corrosive to the teams. So for example, this team brought in this, and the boss noticed that the mean time to reviewing pull requests was longer than he'd like it to be. So he went to the team and said, I need you to bring that number down. And so they, are, they, they thought that it was already pretty good. So they've moved into a culture where they're stamping each other's PRs so that they don't yelled at by the boss. And what do you think happens to their code quality? What do you think happens to exploits and all the other things that we try to prevent through code reviews? So now we've got to create a condition where we're going to produce worse and worse and worse software. So this team, you know, I'm going to make recommendations to the leadership team probably. They need to, you know, maybe have an intervention with the boss, but probably he's got to go. And this 10x guy, we'll see, right? Like if he has different leadership, he might behave differently. And then finally, another thing that happens to these teams, we've probably all seen this before, especially when there's a toxic team. It can hide because when, when you have a toxic team and somebody joins it and it, it's bad, they're, they're just going to wait out their timer. They're not going to be paying attention to the quality of their work. They're not going to be like caring deeply about the code reviews that they do. They're just going to be watching that clock ticking around, waiting for it to hit a year so that they can go interview other places and get a different job. So it's just not less than a year so that they don't get yelled at by, people, by hiring managers. So this is a problem. And so this guy's thinking maybe he'll transfer to the SRE team. Everybody wants to be an SRE, right? And finally, let's go do the incident review. And I'll put this all back together for you. The Onager EV is kind of who asks for this help on this retro. And so I'm here to help her. Um, you know, she says it seems simple technically, and it is simple technically. I, I described to you, they know that there was a schema migration that failed out halfway through the deploy. Most of you understood kind of what, seen something like that before and understood it, right? It's technically fairly simple, but there's so much going on in this organization that contributed to that being a problem for the customers. So let me fill in the whole story. Now that we've talked to a bunch of people, and obviously I, I abbreviated these conversations, had deeper interviews with these folks. So Isabella, just doing normal feature work, was, as I said, noticed that some database tables were inconsistently named. Maybe some things were plural where they should have been singular and things like that. And if you're really into you know, database schemas, you tend to care about these things. And so she thought she'd clean it up, not really understanding that there were people outside of her team that used those tables. So she made an assumption, a fairly safe one, that it was safe to change these table names. And then when she went to run the deploy, she hit the button. The code rolled out to production. Um, the, the migration ran, it failed after a couple of tables, 
And she went, oh, it failed. But because the deploy system usually rolls things back and because the production code hadn't really changed, she didn't think anything of it. And went back to working on other things because of the production pressure this team is under. So this happens all the time. We as SREs get super frustrated when we see these quality issues in our environment that are really, when we go and dig deeper, and it doesn't just have to be through retros, right? This is just how I'm telling this story. Um, and start to understand what the pressures are on the team. So production pressure is a huge one that most of us deal with, where a team just has, is inundated and saturated with work, and they're, they're not able to make good decisions because they're, they're just kind of lost. So Isabella does this, and then the Team Inferno service goes sideways because it can't read those tables anymore because the names, some names have changed, so they're getting exceptions on their stuff. And meanwhile, the customer is having a bad time, but only the customer is using the features that touch those tables. So nobody really noticed right away until the, the error budget burned down light or alert fired. Because they had SLIs and SLOs on these services, they were able to detect that customers were having a bad time as the error budget trickled down, alert fired, and then they were able to go and look at the tables. They went and found our friend Courage, who, who got, was able to log in and cor manually correct things, and then they tabled that PR to come back to later and sort things out and ship that feature. Make sense? Lost everyone? So now we're going to talk about contributing factors. I've asked these folks around the table to kind of say a little bit more about each, each contributing factor. So I, I haven't said the, the, the naughty words root cause on purpose, because if we would have started with root cause, we would have said like, oh, the deploy failed. Root cause, done. We're, I'm out of here. Except that this is why we say root cause is a bad idea to even, to even use, is because we miss all these opportunities to improve the, our environment around us. And so one of the things I've noticed through a lot of incident work, and you, we're going to find this outside of incidents too, and just talking to software engineers, you know, the people that we serve, is usually we don't need to add any heat to mistakes. When somebody has a screw up, like they did, Isabella didn't even screw up. She did perfectly rational things, but she feels terrible about it, right? She was scared she was going to get fired, but she still feels personal responsibility for that mistake that impacted other teams and impacted the customers. And so a thing that I like to be really careful about is to understand that, you know, if most of you, if you make a mistake, who's going to beat you up the hardest? It's you. <laughs> and I know when I make a mistake, that's, nobody's going to be harder on me than I am. So Dr. McFire, you know, is, is comforting Isabella. And it notes, like I said, the production pressure this team is under is probably why she was unable to make a better decision. It contributed anyway. She says, can we monitor for broken schemas? And one of the things I love about, you know, having done a, kind of a lot of incidents, as I've noticed, is like a lot of people get focused on how do we track all the follow-ups? And the reality is that most of the time you don't really have to because what happens, in my experience, very often, especially when a team is healthy or has the capabilities it needs, is that they already fixed it before we get to the incident review. And in this case, Devo Pistoria says, like, before the incident was even over, she noticed what happened and was like, I got this, and added a feature to the deploy pipeline so next time they'll know as soon as it happens and there won't, it, this kind of condition won't happen again. So, we as SREs, right, we have these big brains full of systems knowledge and systems engineering and architecture and, and technical components. We like to look for those little opportunities to be like, ooh, if you did this, you wouldn't have that problem anymore. But I think the, the real magic comes when we enable the folks and the teams around us to see those things for themselves, and then they'll just go do it. So we're kind of more in a supporting role, like you're my white mage. Um, you know, we're the healers in a way. And Manager Greg has learned a lesson. He's going to try to push back harder. Me as a senior principal engineer, at least in my role now, I would go have a talk with the leadership team and, and try to help them understand what's going on with this team and that they need help with managing the throughput. 
the number, amount of work that we're sending at them. And the boss, you know, Kim Creighton says, like, when somebody tells you who they are, and he already told it, believe them, and he already told us who he is, and he's telling us again, you know, he's kind of a jerk. You know, we're coddling the team, but it is your team, so whatever. Um, so, like, are we going to talk about how that change broke our product? And that, that, sir, that, sir, is blame. And I didn't, I didn't go through my, my usual introduction to an incident review, but usually at the front, I say something like, you know, this is a blame aware or blameless retrospective. And if you find that you, you, in this session, you feel like people are, are pushing blame at you or afterwards you feel like there are repercussions or retribution or just people pointing blame at you, you come talk to me and I'll fight anyone. I'll go fight CEO, I'll fight his VP pod. It doesn't matter because like this is really important because we won't find out what's actually going on in these hyper complex systems we all manage if we don't have people feeling safe talking to us about what happened. Our friend Hadassah Lozela, of course, big fan of SLOs, um, and it had set up the SLOs for, for these teams. And notes that, again, if we didn't have a customer-facing metrics that, that told us that the customers were having a bad time, that we would have been down longer. The customer, we might have not noticed for days, or, or, or the worst thing, in my opinion, my worst nightmare is when the customer calls in to say, your system is down. <sighs> I failed as an SRE. And we've, we've kind of already noted Courage is uh, getting excited about the DDL update. And so, this brings us to back to resilience. I mentioned socio-technical engineering. I don't think I've said anything about socio-technical systems for the last 20 minutes or so. Um, but what we're looking at here, this, this is like what I consider one of these core cases of, of adaptive capacity. You've heard John Allspot talk about it, Dr. Richard Cook, um, David Woods, all these, these resilience folks, and a lot of the like jelly folks here like to talk about it. Um, and so like, what, what this talk is about, what, what I want you to all to leave here with, is that you know, the socio-technical work that we can do as SREs after we do all this technical work, going out and working with teams, helping them understand and orient in the socio-technical system that they live in, brings opportunities to increase reliability. This is core to our mission. If, this is why it's so frustrating sometimes in our work where I remember through most of my career, I, again and again, I'd be like, why won't these teams listen? Why aren't they adopting this great technology we built for them? We, we put all this wonderful infrastructure, monitoring, all this crazy stuff in place, but still, they keep struggling, and this is because often the causes for their problems are socio-technical in nature. They're not quite fully social, they're not fully, fully technical, they're in that liminal space between. And so what Courage did in repairing the database is kind of a clear-cut case of adaptive work where it was, there's no runbook, right? This hadn't happened before. Nobody at the company had seen this happen before. There were fundamental surprises happening. And this person brought their expertise, their access, and they logged in their tools. They logged into the database. They evaluated the situation, figured out with their big human brain what was actually going on, created a solution on the fly, under pressure, made the change, and brought the system back to health. That's adaptive capacity in a very tiny nutshell. And so like, when we start to see the adaptive capacity around this, that's what our work is very much as SREs is kind of going into these situations, especially like incident response, right? When we go and log in, we go and you know, roll a, a, pod, a group of pods, sometimes that's adaptive work, because like, maybe we don't have our own book, we're just like, oh, what am I gonna do? You know what, I think this'll work, and try it, and it works. That's, that's a thing that's uniquely human, for us to figure out these things that are outside of our automation. And I stole the line again from our friend Paz Aljon. Um, Team Disco was surprised. The, the, again, this was an unknown unknown. And 
They used their expertise to manually revert, and that was adaptive capacity in action. And so when we talk about resilience, you know, they, we'll, we'll find that, you know, we're going through a phase right now with resilience, and as we've done before with DevOps and Agile, right, where, you know, it was a, it was a pure concept. It had, like, really great ideas, and then some folks wanted to sell products to help with it, and they made it mean other things. And this is why DevOps just kind of means mud now, right? Like, it's just, you ask 10 people what DevOps is, you're going to get 15 different answers. Um, so what resilience is, is this adaptive capacity in action. When we're building adaptive capacity in our organizations, I really do think this is the job of SREs as we move past the technical, you know, we get our technical systems in shape, is to build this adaptive capacity in the teams that we serve so that when they do run into problems, they don't need to run to us. We can stay in bed. We don't, our pager doesn't go off because they have the tools, they have the knowledge, the expertise to respond and figure things out and take care of it. So that's resilience. That's what resilience means. Now there's vendors that are gonna be like, obviously trying to sell you things that will add resilience. But if they're not actually helping your people grow, it's not resilience. It might be robustness that they're adding to your stack, but it's not resilience. And with that, We talked, we went through a town, and we went and we talked to a whole bunch of people. When you're trying to figure out what's going on in your organization, and I know, I started as a systems administrator early in my career. I didn't like people. I thought it was the perfect job because I could hide in the basement of the company and not have to deal with all those people. But once we get past the technical work that's in front of us, the work that remains for increasing reliability, for growing our careers, is people. It's helping them grow. It's helping them understand what's going on. So with that, this was the end game of SRE. I'm Amy Toby. I'm uh, from Equinix. We're hiring. We have a booth in the expo hall. I'll be hanging around there a bit along with some of my colleagues. So please come see us. I have about 13 minutes for questions. So.